Welcome everyone to this Intralingo Spotlight. I'm thrilled today to welcome uh, the author, Dr. Monther Al-Kabani, who is in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Welcome. Hello, hi Lisa. Great, so good to have you here. Thank you, I'm glad to be here as well. Excellent. So, um, Monther, you are a Saudi surgeon and a best-selling novelist. Yes. <laughs> How do you combine those two? <laughs> well, I, I, I know you, you would be surprised how often I get asked that question. As a matter of fact, I was just that uh, two days ago, I was uh, you know, filming a, like a, a documentary for a, a satellite channel. They asked me the exact same question. It seems yes. to be a mystery for everybody except for myself. <laughs> it's, it's just really a matter of uh, time management. I mean, that's the simple truth to it. Yeah. I mean, um, as a doctor, I do, believe it or not, still have some free time. <laughs> it's not like I'm 24-7 working. Yes. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, managing that free time between my, my, my hobbies, my, uh, my family, and mm -hmm. my friends. Yeah, wonderful. So you're, you have seven books, as I said. Um, they are primarily all bestsellers. Your first book is even one of the um, most selling books in Arabic of all time. That's pretty amazing for a first book. Yes, but uh, just to put things in context, because in, in, when you say bestseller in the Arab world, it's not the same as a bestseller in the Western world. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you hear best-selling book of all time, or one of the best-selling book of all time in the Arab world, you think probably it sold like 50 or 80 million, like, like a, a Harry <laughs> Potter novel or a Dan Brown. But in the Arab world, you're talking about hundreds of thousands. I mean, uh, that's it. I mean, uh, of course, that number in the Arab world is considered phenomenal, nevertheless. Yes. And even by Western standards, it's still a lot. But uh, you just have to, I, I don't want people to think that uh, I've sold like 50 or 60 million uh, <laughs> uh, copies because that's not the case. But it is, you're right, it is, it is considered by Arab world standard to be among the top selling novels of all time. You're right. Yes, absolutely. And as you say, you know, 100,000 books anywhere is actually a, a phenomenal number. And I think yeah. mostly it just speaks to um, your books clearly resonate with people. Well, mm -hmm. it's true. And I'm happy for that. I'm, I'm happy that uh, in, I mean, in the Arab world, I managed to uh, sell books because that is in, in itself a very, very difficult task, uh, unfortunately. I mean, I'm, I really hate to say that, but that's mm. the, the honest truth that in the Arab world, the, the number of books usually an author sells is a lot less than you'd expect elsewhere, whether it's in Japan and East Asia and the West. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, hopefully, I mean, it's, we're getting there. I mean, more and more people are reading and more and more people are interested in books. And especially the youth, believe it or not. I mean, with all, it's, it's amazing how with all the entertainment that is around, like mm -hmm. with all the satellite channels and all the, uh, you know, the uh, social media and, and everything else going on, the youth here in the Arab world are the ones leading this uh, resurgence of uh, books. And, you know, they're the ones going on buying books and reading books uh, in spite of all the other forms of entertainment out there. That is fascinating. You know, I, I read something that it's similar here in North America as well, that um, it, it was more related to um, physical books versus ebooks, but they are finding that it's the youth that are buying more physical books in an attempt to slow down, you know, get off their devices a bit more. So, you know, maybe there's hope for our world <laughs> in a lot of ways. You can never beat the, the, the allure of the book. I mean, there is a whole, a whole different experience. I mean, you, you've seen it yourself and me and others. You know, when you read a novel, a nice novel, then you go see the movie. It's never the same. I mean, almost always you love the book more than the, 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 the novel, more than the actual yes. film. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of George R. R. Martin. I read all mm -hmm. his books before they became... Uh, HBO best, you know, a phenomenal HBO series. Right. I can tell you, I mean, the, the novel experiences, as much as the show was great, except of course for the last season, it was as a disaster, you know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it was. Uh, the, the books were really a lot better. I mean, the enjoyment of the books, the details in the books is, is just no comparison. It's much exactly. better than, than the actual drama or the movie. 
Yeah, it's so true. It's it really is all about the detail. I agree. Mm -hmm. So we're we're here today to talk primarily, obviously, about everything, but primarily about your first book in English, which is Warriors and Warlocks Outcast. Uh, it's the first in a trilogy. Um, so I have obviously several questions, but uh, the one I'd like to lead with is. Um, of all your books, why is this the one, the one you decided to uh, proceed with in English first? Well, first of all, Lisa, it's not really my decision at the end mm. of the day, because it's really the decision of the publisher and the, and the translator as well. I mean, they're the ones who have to say what, if the translator uh, loves a book and the publisher also agree to publish it, then that's what gets, uh, that's what gets translated. Uh, but even having said that, if it was my choice, I would have chosen that exact same book to begin with. Uh, okay. The reason being, the reason being is that even though it's it's uh, uh, war, uh, Warriors and Warlocks Part One Outcast is my third novel in Arabic. It's my third published novel. And like yes. you mentioned earlier, there was two prior novels. The first one was was a phenomenal success, but nevertheless, Warriors and Warlocks is really the first my first commercial as well as academic and critical success. The first two novels, they were commercially successful, but uh, on, the, on the critical or, or, or academic front, uh, they were not as, as successful. I mean, they didn't really garner as much, uh, you know, uh, critical acclaim. Uh, Warriors and Warlocks was a different story altogether. I mean, it was really a book that not only succeeded quite well and sold a lot of copies, uh, quite comparable to my first two books, even the mm -hmm. first one, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. But on the same front, it received a, a, a quite a tremendous academic acclaim. As a matter of fact, uh, there has been a number of dissertations, university dissertations, just yeah. about these novels. It's just, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I got an email from a PhD student in a university in Algiers telling me that she just finished her dissertation on, on the trilogy. And that, that's all the way in Algeria. I mean, uh, and Algeria is quite far from Saudi Arabia, if you just look at the map. <laughs> yes. uh, and that's not to mention the universities, in, in the local universities in Saudi Arabia, same thing. I mean, there's, in the past year alone, I, I counted five different dissertations from di five different universities across yeah. the Arab world that I'm aware of, not to mention the ones that I'm not aware of. Uh, so it really garnered a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, critical success besides the commercial success. And it just felt that's befitting that that would be the first novel for, uh, of mine to be translated into English. Now, having said that, my second novel, uh, which is The Return of the Absentee, has been translated two years ago uh, into French. Okay. Uh, and that was a, uh, yes, and that was a project that was actually uh, led by the Saudi cultural uh, mission in France. They chose a number of select novels uh, from Saudi Arabia. And, and my novel, uh, Return of the Absentee, which is number two in terms of publication date, was selected uh, for, public, for translation into French. Excellent. Oh, that's great. I, I wasn't aware of that. That's, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. So um, Outcast or, or the Warriors and Warlocks series is, um, it's described as being genre bending. Uh, <laughs> and it yeah. definitely is that quite seamlessly. How do you introduce the book? How do you describe it? Well, like you just said, it's, uh, it's, you cannot categorize it into a specific genre. It's more of a combination of, uh, of history, fantasy, science fiction, uh, a bit of philosophy. Uh, and uh, uh, to be honest with you, I mean, I intended it to be like that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Arab world specifically, uh, this is probably the first kind of genre bending novel of its kind. I mean, you don't see a lot of uh, uh, genre bending novels, even in the, in the in the Western world. I mean, this is more of something that you see more typical of maybe uh, you know Asian uh, Asian literature, mm -hmm. uh, Murakami kind of uh, literature right. style, and so forth. But in the Arab world, it's not really common, and I can go as far as saying that this is probably one of the first or earliest novels to have such multi-genre mixed into a single novel. Uh, and I did, uh, all, every novel I publish, or every, every novel I write, let me put it that way, regardless of whether it gets published or not, I always try to introduce something new. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. want it to be just 
like any like other novel that I even written or that's out there. I, I, that's why you see in my seven novels, they're not all the same type. I mean, they're, they're quite different actually. Like mm -hmm. the first two novels is a, is a certain style. The trilogy is a certain style. My sixth novel is totally different. It's just a, a like a, a black romance, if you can say. And my fifth novel is different. Uh, my seventh novel, I mean, is different. So I always try to introduce something different, uh, different from what I usually write, and also different from what's out there in the in the uh, Arab world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, uh, that's amazing. Actually, you know, it's uh, it's not easy to um, to change styles or to change. Uh, it speaks to to you as a writer. Well, for me, it's part of the challenge and part of the joy. I mean, I don't like to just repeat myself. As mm -hmm. much as I get, to, you know, many of my readers, they want a continuation of the same that they like. And it is tempting to continue just, if you have a successful formula, believe me, one of the easiest thing to do is just continue on that formula until it doesn't become successful anymore and then try to change. <laughs> but to change, but to change see your style in the midst of a success it is a challenge, but for me, it's, it's not a matter of how many books I sell. It's really a matter of how much enjoyment I find from the writing process. Mm. And I'm the type of person who just, uh, you know, uh, doesn't like to continue doing the same thing over and over again. I don't like to be just, you know, a, a one trick wonder, you, know, mm -hmm. you might say. I'd like to even challenge myself, try different styles, different uh, uh, themes and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you said that, um, you know, this particular genre bending, that it does blend the sci-fi and the philosophy and the historical fiction as well is, is unusual. I think it's not only unusual in Saudi Arabia or, or the Arab world, but, but here as well. Um, but also, uh, it, it really fits so perfectly with um, the publisher that was chosen or the publisher that, that picked up this novel in English, which is really one of their missions, isn't it, is to, is to bring science fiction more to the Arab world uh, as well as elsewhere. That's correct, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, Yetakhayalun is, uh, is uh, as you know, it's, uh, is basically led by two uh, really great uh, writers and right. good friends of mine, which is mm. Yasser Bahjat and uh, Ibrahim Abbas. Uh, and they themselves, uh, you know, are big believers and big uh, proponents of uh, sci-fi in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to have them uh, believe in, uh, you know, my novels and especially the Warriors and Warlocks trilogy and uh, to have, uh, you know, played a big role in, uh, in uh, getting this project uh, translated into English and sort of exposing it to the English speakers. I mean, mm -hmm. this was always a dream of mine, actually, to have uh, uh, my, my, my books, uh, you know, to be translated into other languages, and especially English. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, English for me is, is like a, it's not really a second language. It's more of a, a second first language. I mean, uh, yes. uh, for me, English is, I, I studied in American school from fifth grade. I graduated from American school. I studied medicine in English. So English for me is just as almost as strong as Arabic. Mm -hmm. And I would have loved, and it was a dream of mine to have it translated into English and hopefully into other languages. And definitely at the Khayalun uh, played a big role in that, in fulfilling mm -hmm. that dream. Yeah, they seem to be doing fantastic work. I, it's really wonderful to see. Yeah. So Outcast um, tells the story of, uh, of a Saudi surgeon who uh, is in present day, may or may not be you. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, Dr. Murad, he suddenly finds himself back in the time of the Mongols in the, in the 1200s. And uh, there is science and philosophy, as you said, peppered throughout this novel. And it's just kind of dropped like breadcrumbs for the reader to follow. None of it is explicit or explained, um, which I think it's left, uh, it treats the reader as being very intelligent and able to pick up on what they want to pick up on or are able to, but we don't have to know about um, the multiverse or string theory or, or anything like that. Can you talk about your intent in, in writing the novel that way of, of giving us some science, but, but not overwhelming us with it? Well, keep in mind, I mean, at the end of the day, this is a novel. It's not yeah. meant to be a, a guide to string theory or to quantum <laughs> physics. 
I do exactly. I do introduce it, and probably you'll see more of it in, in part two. Uh, there will be more. I mean, discussion of this, mm -hmm. but. Uh, the, the the whole I mean the novel at the end of the day it's a it's a work of literature and and it's not meant to be an educational material mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing the other thing is I always try to include elements of uh, let me put it this way I always try to have my readers at the end of any book I write to have questions to raise questions mm -hmm. of their minds and then have them go try to answer these questions on their own. I'm not a proponent of answering every single question to the reader. I mean, I, I find that to be actually uh, wrong. And it, it even uh, in a way it, it detracts from their imagination. When I personally read a book, I always like to have that element of mystery. I always like to have questions being popped at me. And then I try to seek the answers. Whether these answers are correct or not, that's beside the point. It's really the process of trying to figure out the answer that matters. Mm -hmm. And that's what, and that's the kind of experience I try to, uh, to create for my readers, to try to find answers to certain questions. And it doesn't matter whether they get the right answer or not. What matters mm -hmm. to me is the process itself, the journey towards uh, answering these questions, what matters. Yeah, that's wonderful. I think um, you're right that often, uh, and you know, and this is a, a generalization, which I, I, sh I shouldn't do, but um, you know, sometimes sci-fi does feel a little bit like it's trying to educate the reader, whereas this very much is for us to explore, uh, which I think is what one of the reasons that can make it such a popular read. Mm -hmm. That's correct, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I'm curious for you as a man of science, um, what are your thoughts on the multiverse? Why was this uh, something that you wanted to explore, if there was any reason? Well, it all goes really with the one of the main themes of uh, the trilogy is that reality is not necessarily how you perceive it. Mm -hmm. And I included multiple examples of that. I included an example from from the actual uh, uh, protagonist, Barat Kotos, the main hero of the trilogy, who suddenly is discovering a reality around him that is not, in, that is not in keeping with what he remembers or what he thinks. Hmm. On another level, and this is something that maybe uh, the, uh, the Western reader would not realize it, but it's something that really resonated quite hard with, with Arabic readers, is how I depicted the, the Mongols. Now, in, in, in the Arabic culture, the Mongols are depicted in a, in a, in a, in a uh, quite a mainstream view that they're just savages, they're bloodthirsty killers who went on and you know, invaded the, the Muslim world for no apparent reason, apart that there are savages and so forth. But I introduced a different side, which is actually more in keeping with historical facts than what's usually taught in the Arab world, when that is that there is actually a, a reason behind the madness and that the Mongols, even though they are uh, they, they are savages, but they also had culture. They also had some bright side to them. They also had, they were an encompassing uh, empire. They were truly, as some historians describe them, as the first truly secular, uh, multi-ethnic uh, uh, society where you find Muslims and Christians and, uh, and uh, uh, Buddhist and Hindu and mm -hmm. all religions among the elite. It does, I mean, the way the, the Genghis Khan built his empire is that he built it on merit, meritocracy. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, whether you're an Arab or a Turk or a, or a uh, European or whatever, and it doesn't matter what your religion is, as long as you prove merit useful, then you're a valuable member of the Mongol empire. Now, this is a, an aspect that was quite shocking to the Arab reader because that's not how they read about them. So this is another, another example of where, I, where I put where reality is not in keeping with perception. The mm -hmm. third example I put is, theories from, the, from physics, like quantum mechanics and the super string theory that introduces the multiverse. Now, believe it or not, I mean, these are uh, 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 theories in physics that are quite accepted by many, many prominent physicists. Mm -hmm. They tell us that there is, it's not just a one universe, it's a multiverse, that the, this is the only way to explain uh, you know, uh, the world that we live in it, is that to have more, more than one universe, and they are all parallel. It, this sounds, of course, crazy. I mean, if you ask anybody, any common person, ask him, you know, what does that sound like to you? He'd tell you this sounds more like science fiction. What do you mean by a multiverse and parallel universes? Mm -hmm. But then when you tell him this is what physics say, this is what modern physics say, 
you know, they'd be perplexed because this is science as we know it, at least for now. Yes. So this is another example of where reality doesn't necessarily match our perception of it that I wanted to give to the, to the reader. And, and the general question that I wanted to ask him, the, the, the reader, that is, do you actually think that everything you see around you is necessarily true? Or could mm -hmm. there be a layer of truth behind what you see or perceive as being truth that could be even more so than what you think? Mm -hmm. That is, uh, yeah, that is so great. I was, I actually was going to ask you about um, uh, also that notion that you mentioned there of, of, we perceive it a couple of times in the book in terms of, um, I don't quite want to call it racism, but there is an element of that there. It starts in, you know, in present day when Murad, um, his uh, intended, you know, is not able to to marry because he is of Abkhazian descent. Uh, and then it definitely comes up again later in terms of the view of the Mongols. Um, it's, it's a very modern day um, commentary as well. Well, unfortunately, prejudice exists in all times, in all places. I mean, this mm -hmm. is something that exists everywhere, and it doesn't seem to be bound by, by any boundaries or by, by even time. You see prejudice like that all over and throughout time. And I wanted to put that as an example of, uh, of how prejudice is, uh, is existent in our societies. Uh, and it's not something that is just now, or it's not something that it, just in this locality, but it's something that is quite universal because people generally speaking, they, they fear what they don't know. And they always want things that are close to them and like them. Mm -hmm. People in general, they don't like what's different or they don't feel comfortable with what's different. Yes. Whether that something is a thought or a person, uh, an ethnicity, a religion, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's so true, you know, and I must say that, uh, you know, one of, of my intentions at Intralingo is, is to introduce the different um, precisely because um, there's nothing to fear and there's a lot to explore and understand and, uh, and gain from that. So, so I love that element of your book. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, another thing that I wanted to to look at in the book is is this notion of um, there's a very dreamlike quality to to the book as a whole, and in part that comes, um, you know, in in the the middle and later part when Murad goes back in time um, because he's uncertain where he is and isn't sure what is happening. Things are not as he thought they were. Um, and we very much um, feel for Murad that he is lost and doesn't understand what has happened. Um, but there's also an element maybe where we feel that Murad is a bit of an unreliable narrator because he doesn't entirely know um, what's going on. I'd love to hear from you, uh, your thoughts about Murad as, is he re and a reliable narrator for us or, or, or not? Well, Murad, I mean, the trilogy is really, I mean, if, if you look at it at its core, it's really the process or the path of Murad uh, learning what exactly is going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a journey, let me put it this way. It's a journey of him trying to understand who he is, and why, why what happened to him happened to him, and how that is related with everything that is around him, whether it's in the present or in the past. So in the beginning, yes, he, he, he doesn't know what's going on. He's unreliable. He, he's confused. He's afraid. Uh, just like you'd imagine somebody would be if he's put in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but you will notice that that will start changing in book two. And definitely, I mean, I'm, I don't want to basically give away the, the story, but, <laughs> no. but th there is going to be a journey, a journey and a change in, in how reliable Murad will become. And it's just basically his path. It's his path towards... Uh, knowledge towards understanding. Mm -hmm. That's great. One of the ways I think it can be interpreted as well or, or um, is that as it goes along, there's a certain notion of maybe determinism or, or self-reliance or self-understanding. And it's almost like as, as Murad goes along and he stops kind of fighting and figuring out where where he is and what's going on that um, he seems to just be a lot more um, comfortable just following his instincts. Is this notion of determination, self-determination in there as well? 
Well, you know, one of the most important themes that really is, exists in the in the Arab world and probably the whole Muslim world is this no th notion of are, are, uh, do we choose our path or is it mm. chosen for us? And I think that's a common theme even in, in the Western world sure. where, you know, are, are, are you basically a, uh, a, follow, a, a follower of destiny? Are, are things determined as they are supposed to be? And you're just living the way you're supposed to live or do you get to choose your destiny? I mean, that's a major theme that, that really, uh, you know, uh, resonates with a lot of readers in the, in the Arab mm. world and even in the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the actually themes that I try to allude to in the in the trilogy, and that is, do we create our own path, or is that path already chosen for us? Now, I'm not going to give you the answer. That's something that you'll have to discover, you and the rest of the readers, on your own when you finish reading the trilogy. But you will see, a big, you know, the beginnings of this discussion between Murad and Abdurrahman, who is another interesting character mm -hmm. uh, in the novel, and which is, you know, uh, this this whole dynamic of you know whether you whether this path has been forced upon you, Murad, uh, and he has no say in it, or whether there is an element of uh, choice in it, or it's a combination of both. Mm. So this will be this duality. We'll will will we'll even see more of it in, in 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 book two, as Murad tries to understand what's going on and what's happening to him, and as Abdurrahman tries to uh, you know try to help Murad seeking the answers rather than giving it to him. Uh, you know, on a, on a silver plate. Yes. I think that's one of the elements that I loved about this book as well, is that, that notion of the, of these riddles and um, the, um, as a way for not only the characters, but the reader to start to explore these topics. Answers are not given, but thoughts or statements in the form of riddles are there for us to explore. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's great. There's so much in this book, as you say, it's, um, it, it is uh, filled with, um, well, adventure. Uh, it's eminently readable because we are carried along, at least I think in part for us as Western readers, as Europeans, North Americans, um, there is this wonderful transportation in time, but to a, a place that many of us do not know, the notion of, of you know, grand deserts and caravans and walled ancient cities, it's, it's magical. Um, but there is also this philosophy and, uh, and a lot of humanity. Every one of the characters is um, just supremely human, the way you have portrayed them. You're absolutely right. At the end of the day, we're dealing with humans. I mean, regardless yeah. of the supernatural circumstances that they're in, but at the end of the day, they're humans that are dealing with it. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a wonderful book. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as I told you, so in my reading circle, we're reading it in the World Lit Collective. Um, and I have received text messages and emails <laughs> from the participants. We don't speak for a couple of weeks saying, can I get the next book? When can I get the next <laughs> book? <laughs> they are all supremely eager, uh, as am I, to, to continue reading this trilogy. So um, is the next book in the works? It is, it is. Nice. Tim is working hard on it. Uh, the plan is to have it, I mean, hopefully the, the publisher's uh, time frame is to have book two published in uh, the summer of 2020 and then book three a year after that. I mean, that was the Fabulous. intention. I don't know if they're going to release it earlier or not, if, mm -hmm. uh, because they, like you said, there has been, I mean, there has been some demand. I mean, a lot of readers are, it's resonating uh, a lot with a lot of Western readers. I mean, that's something quite nice. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, keep asking when is book two going to be out? So we'll see. But I mean, the, the original plan, like I said, is that we'll have one book per year. So book one was okay. published this year, book two, 2020, and book three, uh, 2021. Excellent. Well, we very much all look forward to it. So, uh, and hopefully some of your other works, it would be wonderful to, to read your, your work as a whole. Uh, yes, I would love that. Nothing more would please me. 
Great. Good. Well, we ha I have also had a, a wonderful conversation with the translator, Tim Gregory. Um, I'll be sharing that uh, as well, because it's, it's always great to hear, um, you know, a translator. There's nobody who reads a book like a translator. I'm a translator in as well. And uh, we read these um, to such uh, a degree of depth. It's a, it's a really neat perspective as well to hear from the translator. It is, it is. And uh, Tim has been great. I mean, uh, uh, Tim and I, I mean, uh, work quite closely together. We have our own WhatsApp group uh, yes. that we communicate with along with the publisher. And uh, it's really been uh, quite fun working with Tim. Uh, he's, he's a great translator. I mean, yeah. Obviously, he did a great job. You guys read the, the, the book and you yeah. obviously, uh, you know, liked it, as you mentioned. And that's mm -hmm. uh, partly, uh, I mean, due to the fact that Tim did a great job. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I'm quite happy to have worked with him and uh, it's always good to have his own uh, perspective on the matter. It's, uh, it's very important, no doubt. Yeah, excellent. That's wonderful. Well, thank you again, um, Monta, for speaking with me. It has been wonderful. Um, I'm going to absolutely include all your contact information, your bio, how you can be found on Twitter in the notes below this. Um, uh, broadcast and uh, and I hope to speak to you again when uh, the next book is out. Well thank you very much Lisa for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation and uh, uh, my best wishes in regards to you and all the rest of uh, the readers and uh, you know I'm it makes me really uh, happy to see that the book resonated with the uh, mm -hmm. English speakers just as it did in, uh, in the Arab world. I mean uh, it means that there's a lot of commonality between people throughout cultures. I mean it's not just a matter of you know Arab readers having their own taste of books and English uh, speaking uh, readers have their own taste of books, but a book can resonate with more than one culture and more than one language. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm a big proponent as well as at the We all believe in that there's a lot of novels in the, in the Arab world that deserves to be read uh, by readers from various languages, from various cultures, and that the Arab world has a lot to offer. I mean, Arabic literature is rich, but unfortunately we suffer from the fact that there isn't enough translators. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, just to give you an example, my, uh, this novel has been published in Arabic in 2012 mm -hmm. and it came out in English in 2019. So you're yes. talking about what, a, a seven year span. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps I'm one of the lucky few. I mean, there are many others, and great writers, really great writers who haven't had the chance to get any of their work translated. And as a result, nobody you know, outside the Arab world read them. and. Uh, uh, and they didn't manage to communicate with them uh, on a literary front. And that's to me is a big shame. Uh, so hopefully, you know, this will create further interest in Arabic uh, uh, literature as a whole and in Saudi literature in specific. And hopefully we'll see more books, whether my books or else other uh, novelists being translated mm -hmm. into English and other Western languages. Absolutely. You know, I, I think that, uh, again, as a, as a translator myself, um, you know, we, there is far too uh, little translation published in English and, uh, and this opening up of the world and reading other cultures, other perspectives, other novelists is, is so important. And it goes right back to what you said earlier, which is we are just all human. And when we can see that in one another's literature, points of view, perspectives, um, it uh, it's really makes a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you again. And uh, we shall talk soon. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, take care.